going back to your, your career journey, who have been some strong influences or mentors, if you like, that have helped sort of shape your philosophy today? Yeah, I've thought about this and I don't know if I've just been really lucky or if sport just breeds good people, but I've been super lucky everywhere I've worked. I've just worked with some phenomenal people and um, and some that I still call friends this day, but one standout who, you know, I think every time I do a podcast, I just have to mention his name. He's been on your podcast before, but Ben Sapel. So he's still my supervisor um, and he was my boss at the Brumbies. He was the head of performance at the time. And he, I listened to his interview with you actually. And the, the problem with him is just, he's too humble and he'll never, he'll never brag about all the knowledge that he has or all the research that he has and how good he actually is. But, you know, we mm. still message probably three or four times a week. What have you seen the most effective way to measure uh, how the athlete, like how well the reco- how re- well recovered the athlete is, or their freshness, or their you know readiness to to perform. Um, yeah, is it a subjective check in, and um, uh, using your coach's eye and, and seeing how they are presenting, and while you're having a conversation with them, and and, and you know their read on it, on how they're feeling. Uh, is it more objective with potentially heart rate variability? Yeah, how, how do you like to sort of see how your athletes are responding to the training load? Yeah, look, there's always, um, I think there's always like best practice, of course, but then there's your environment with your athletes. So in the NBA, for example, like, unfortunately, there is no wellness. There is no heart rate variability. It's very challenging to get um, the players, especially when I first got there, to, to jump on force plates. So monitoring, say, neuromuscular fatigue, for example, um, using force plate metrics was also quite challenging. So in that situation, it really does um, become just conversations. What would influence your decision making when you're trying to reduce load? Well, we're not when you're trying to, but if you're, you know, thinking you're going to take a player out of a drill, was it uh, the wellness metrics that you you're big on, and that, uh, and and then re- and how the athlete is feeling, and when they when you go and check in with them, is it more objective? Is it more just let's just see how they go and try and push them to to get out there? And yeah, you know, what sort of your approach? over pre-season it's such a tough tough one to answer because i think you know context is king i think that's always always the case and there's always going to be a myriad of variables that are contributing to your decision to do that for me Mm. like i always have this performance first mindset rather than an injury risk reduction i know people throw that around these days and it's become what somewhat of a buzz term but for me, consistency is the most important thing. Can we just get them out there training regularly? I, you know, and uh, yes, of course, there's always that fine line, but oh, if we push them today, then that means they could lose a week of training and so on. But what can they do? So if they are sore, so we're looking at, say, posterior chain soreness or fatigue, and we're about to go into a speed session. It's like, okay, well, do they really need to run at 90 or 95% of their maximum velocity? Perhaps you you get the feeling that um, they're more just under-recovered or under-prepared going into that session opposed to overloaded. But uh, how do you go about educating, maybe developing players on the importance of living an elite lifestyle? Yeah, so I think that's really important. Um, I got really into behavioural economics about a few years ago. And I realized that a lot of what we want the athlete to do is essentially just a behavior change. So Mm -hmm. I just read a whole bunch of books and and looked at, okay, how can we actually change the environment to, so the athlete actually doesn't even need to think. So it's all sort of set out for them. So it's how we, we place certain items of food at the lunch bar. It's how we set up the whole gym. It's how like the flow of it all. So I think that's really important. Um, in terms of creating that behavior change but the education piece is also really important how would you manage the sort of group when you're going those present presentations to make it engaging but also for them to have some key actionables yeah so get rid of the writing they're not going to read anything you can have one number on there or maybe one word um, and then just talk to the slide but also images so images illustrations so how can you sum your point in a picture because uh, I'm not going to say all of them, but a lot of them will learn visually. And um, so trying to, obviously we can't do anything kinesthetic and they're going to be listening to me anyway. So I've got to try and hit as many points as I can. 
without using writing. The other one is players love to look at videos of themselves. They absolutely love it and they love to look at photos of themselves. So actually getting footage of them, um, you know, in the gym or getting food or something and then playing that because the boys will listen, they'll have a good laugh 